Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a pre-recorded webinar to help potential applicants apply for the Drive Change Fund in the 2020 round. Uh, obviously, we are unable to do the in-person classes that we had scheduled, but I'm hoping between the information provided on the website and uh, this webinar uh, will allow most applicants to at least get started. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, I'm available for questions via phone or email um, as more specifics of the project um, get formed over these next couple of weeks. Um, this will be available on the website. Um, and you can feel free to share it with other folks in your community or in your organization uh, that might be interested in the Drive Change Fund. I'm hoping today to give a, a high level overview of the fund, what the application process looks like, and then maybe some tips for how to complete a successful application. Uh, please excuse any background noise. I have a very protective dog. Um, but I will do my best to make sure it is clear um, and uh, the right volume so you can hear all the, the finer details. Uh, I'm Dan Janicek. I'm the grants manager for Portland General Electric, and this is applying to the Drive Change Fund. Starting off with today's roadmap, so you can see what you're in store for. Uh, we're going to do some background on understanding the Drive Change Fund, where it came from, where the money comes from, uh, what are some of the key pillars, uh, things that I think are good background and context as you're filling out an application, um, and that will help us build towards some of the uh, requirements and preferences that we're going to look for uh, for 2020 and beyond. Uh, we'll discuss briefly uh, if a project is eligible. We do have eligibility criteria uh, on our website in one of our various PDFs, um, but I think sometimes seeing it and hearing it might help clarify uh, what parts of a project would be eligible for funding. Um, I'll touch on how to create an effective application, so an application that's both complete and hopefully competitive. Um, just to be clear, uh, no guarantees, obviously, this is a competitive grant process, but at the same time, um, we want to make sure that we're giving you every possible tool and all the support to make a good application. Um, I'll overview the timeline from today moving forward for the end of the year, and then ultimately, uh, hopefully, your project completion um, at um, by the end of next year. Um, you know, pending anything unforeseen. Uh, and then we'll do a quick summary with some deliverables, some takeaways. You know, if, um, if everything else um, doesn't make sense, hopefully the last couple of slides will summarize everything and make it easily digestible and distributable uh, to others in your organization or any interested parties. Okay, uh, history and purpose of the Drive Change Fund is up first. Dive into what makes a good project, what's been successful, successful, the eligibility guidelines, and then requirements versus preferences. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Renewable Development Fund, uh, very similar in terms of we have requirements and then also some things we'd prefer to see or like to see, um, and that might shift year to year. Um, the funding timeline and finally summary and next steps. Um, so hope we can touch on all of these um, and this is a good starting point uh, for those of you who are ready to complete an application but just want a little bit more support or a little bit more detail. So PG and the Drive Change Fund, we're going to talk about why transportation electrification is such an important part of the puzzle um, and how that fits with PGE's broader goals. So you can see uh, some more context here. So uh, the Drive Change Fund, this is our second year offering the fund. We had a very successful and very competitive 2019. Um, we're looking to really build upon that this year. So it is a competitive grant fund uh, specifically focused on supporting projects that further the advancement of transportation electrification. So that's pretty broad in terms of what transportation electrification or TE represents. 
Uh, and that was on purpose. We really want this fund to be driven by the applicants and have projects that really benefit the communities they serve. So we're trying hard to be a partner here um, and we're trying hard to be a responsible steward of the dollars because it's not coming from PGE specifically. Uh, on top of that, there is an external stakeholder group that represents some of the diverse interests in our communities, uh, organizations big and small that want to make sure that this money is spent um, correctly and responsibly, uh, and that also that we are getting to the impacts that we intend to get to. So, uh, you know, a very impact-driven fund, um, and we think that um, the best way is to put that money in the hands of organizations that are really fueled by the communities they serve and work in. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the, per, the Drive Change Fund um, is one of numerous initiatives that PG is undertaking uh, in the realm of transportation electrification, um, but it is, not fun, it is funded uh, by the sales of clean fuels credits via the Clean Fuels Program from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. So this is not PGE dollars. Uh, this is money that is based on the sale of clean fuels credits that then funds the fund. So I want to be really clear that while we are involved and heavily interested, um, we are, this is not money coming from either stakeholders or specifically from PGE customers. Um, this is um, just a way that we can get money back into the community. For 2020, we have $2.25 million available. That's all available to be uh, distributed this year, and that's available at 100% funding of eligible costs. So I'll talk briefly about what's eligible in a later slide, but the, the document on the Drive Change Fund website, www portlandgeneral.com slash drive change. Um, that will list out what's eligible and what's not. But we are, um, we have funded projects at 100% in the past. Um, that's certainly something that we're eligible for this year. Um, cost sharing is, um, is nice and certainly will be scored higher if, if an organization is able to take on some of those project costs. But um, this is meant to be focused on some smaller organizations that really don't have the capital to do this, but whose constituents and whose um, community could really benefit from this impact. Uh, also keep in mind that financial and technical assistance is available. Uh, we realize that TE isn't for everybody and the expertise needed uh, might not exist within an organization to the, the depth necessary. So uh, we are offering uh, financial assistance for the smaller, the smallest nonprofits, uh, and then technical assistance for everybody, uh, whether that be a site assessment, discussing options for a vehicle, um, a line extension for your service for a charger, anything like that. Uh, please reach out, and we'll get you in touch with the right people. Uh, and then this last little bit is the types of projects that are eligible. So um, eligible projects include uh, acquiring electric vehicles, uh, installing charging infrastructure, uh, various levels, uh, education and awareness campaigns, outreach, um, realizing that that's still very important while um, EVs might seem commonplace to some of us, um, they are re relatively unknown in other parts of our um, community. So uh, realizing how important it is to spread that information. And finally, a catch-all of other innovative ideas. We don't pretend to believe that this is all the possible project types, or there are things that, we, that we've thought of everything. I'm sure there's a lot of creative people out there who have come up with projects that really move the needle. Uh, and that's what we need. So that's what we're um, kind of depending on all you for uh, to come up with those types of projects. So your project must be at least one of those types. Uh, likely it will be a combination of more than one, uh, depending on your scope and what kind of impact you're trying to have. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, I think it's important, and now that we have the history, to talk about some of the design principles, uh, really the pillars about what this was built upon. 
Um, I won't read through all of these, but some of the ones that I think are uh, ex especially important, um, you know, the first one of supporting uh, electrification of Oregon's transportation sectors. Transportation is a, a very large greenhouse gas emitter in Oregon and worldwide. Um, and the more that we can get traditional gas vehicles, uh, you know, exchanged out for electric vehicles is going to allow us to control emissions that much more finely um, and, um, you know, really start to improve the, the health of the, the environment that, that we are in. So um, that's a big goal and certainly the main pillar of this fund is to further transportation electrification. Um, but an equally important pillar is um, providing benefits to um, underserved communities and residential customers that traditionally have not been uh, impacted or have not benefited from these advances in technology or advances in equipment. So um, we are really focused on driving the dollars and the benefits to those customers that um, we have not been as successful at reaching um, and maybe don't ha have the opportunity to interact with this technology nearly as often. So we will uh, we have a built in preference to really ha make sure there's an impact in those areas of our service territory. Um, so we'll harp on that again and again as we're trying to determine um, you know, the most deserving awardees for a given round. Um, and then one more I think is important to, to discuss as well. Um, it is that these uh, this program is independent from ratepayer support. So this is money again from the clean fuels program. Um, so this is not PGE dollars. This is us stewarding those dollars and hopefully driving those benefits again back to those residential customers and back to those communities that have been uh, fairly not touched by uh, anything we've been doing in the TE sector. And we think the best way of doing that is working with community partners, community leaders that know much better than we do what these communities need and what would be actually beneficial and impactful to them. So after kind of wrapping up the background section, um, I do think it's important to look at uh, who received a, an award last year. Um, I think this is good context for folks that might be wondering if their organization or their proposal or both might fit into the scope of the Drive Change Fund. Um, and maybe if you don't see a similar project up here, maybe it's a, a way to, to open that path for a new idea or something we haven't done previously. So um, we had 16 great recipients last year, really wonderful to work with that are well on their way to completing their projects. Um, you know, we tried to have a diverse blend of organizations and people and projects as much as possible while keeping in mind our main pillars. So it's really important for us um, to keep growing this list. Um, you know, we want to diversify further uh, geographically. Um, we want to diversify further in types of projects and we want to diversify further in the types of communities that we've been able to work with. So, um, you know, we have a big service territory with a really um, a great mix of different people and different places. And we think those are all deserving of an award and we'll work to, to drive towards that end as much as possible. Okay, um, so now that we've gone through some background, hopefully you have some more context for what we're looking for um, and how important this is to PGE. Um, now we're gonna talk about some of the requirements, uh, the preferences and the expectations of applicants and uh, eventual awardees. Um, so you know a little bit more about uh, how to structure your application um, and what we might be looking for in a given round. So to be very clear, uh, we have some technical requirements, again, also available on the website in a PDF. If your project involves a vehicle, it must be capable of charging from the electric grid. Kind of goes without saying. Um, charging infrastructure has to be safe. Safety is of paramount importance to PGE. 
So for anything that you're doing, safety has to be the number one priority. Um, but it has to be safe and meet code requirements. Uh, it has to have, have interop interoperability for hardware and software depending on its use and where it'll be located and how you plan on interacting with it. Um, it has to be networked and enabled for demand response. Um, we'll be collecting uh, usage data for both vehicles and charging infrastructure. So uh, you should keep that in mind of how is it going to be communicating, how is it going to be reporting, uh, and then for charging infrastructure, the demand response piece is very important um, for PGE's long-term planning purposes. Uh, and then if that charging structure is publicly accessible, um, some other things to keep in mind are, you know, the charging rates, how uh, that accepts credit card payments, that it's labeled with the appropriate branding, um, you know, things that the general public will need to know if you're going to utilize it like that. It doesn't need to be publicly accessible for a project, um, but it's good to have that clearly thought out ahead of time so that the selection committee can judge appropriately. If you have questions about any of the technical requirements, um, I definitely suggest getting in touch with me and my colleagues and we can point you in the right direction. Or if you're already working with a contractor, uh, they might be able to decipher this more if this doesn't seem to make sense at first glance. So please utilize those resources. So well, we have our requirements in terms of, um, you know, where the money should be directed towards, what we can fund, and what the technical requirements are. Uh, we do have preferences that we have built over the last year uh, through discussions with various applicants, through our stakeholder group, and internal discussions with the selection committee and other people involved. So uh, I want to just be really clear that these are preferences. This is not a requirement of anybody, but this is what we'd like to see for 2020. And you'll see this shift uh, year after year as you know uh, we respond to you know our our communities and respond to their needs. So uh, we think that um, a nonprofit or a public agency has the highest chance of success and of driving those benefits back to the communities. Uh, those organizations are generally more community led and are uh, have a better uh, voice of the community uh, with their decision makers. Um, there's also less of a chance of this money going towards um, uh, some unintended. Um, directions um, with it with a nonprofit. So those are the those are the organizations that we're preferring to see. Um, this next point is a little bit uh, mashed together, but we prefer a new electric vehicle versus an, a used electric vehicle. There's room for both, but we think that new electric vehicles have greater range, greater comfortability, greater safety features, um, and are helping to advance um, EV adoption because you're buying new ones to create more opportunities. Used ones are a, a great option and, and the, the right proposal could absolutely be appropriate, but we prefer new versus used. We prefer a battery EV versus a plug-in hybrid. Again, given the circumstance, a plug-in hybrid might make sense, but we think that the, the pros of a battery EV greatly outweigh the cons and greatly outweigh the, the pros of a plug-in hybrid. So we prefer you to use a battery electric vehicle in your project. Uh, and finally, we prefer a project that moves people as opposed to moves goods. Uh, we think direct interaction with these technologies is going to be a lot more impactful than um, you know, secondary or a degree removed interaction. So getting food delivery with electric vehicles, great, because you see it and obviously there's a benefit but driving in an electric vehicle to go to an appointment or for something like that is a lot more um, tangible to folks. And I know in my personal experience made a much bigger difference of how I viewed electric vehicles. So I think that's, um, that's where we're, we're preferring to, to do um, for this year. We prefer projects that are in service within 12 months of the award being distributed. Um, with the COVID-19 that has shifted and we have, um, we're being as flexible as possible with those organizations who are uh, really being negatively impacted and unable to meet those expectations. 
So um, we'll continue to be flexible and adaptable as needed, but we would like this money to go out the door and to be invested back in the community as quick as possible. Um, of course, keeping safety and keeping realistic expectations. We do prefer to see projects that impact PGE service territory. Does not mean it has to be cited in PGE service territory. The requirement is that the project benefits PGE customers. But if your site is located not in PGE territory, but serves a majority of PGE customers, then there is an opportunity for you to receive a drive change fund award. Uh, community college is a very good example of you might have a majority of students who come and drive from PGE territory to attend classes at a college, but maybe the college itself is not in PGE territory. Uh, however, we still prefer to see it in our territory. We think that's the safest bet. Uh, and finally, and perhaps more, most importantly, uh, projects that address the needs of underserved communities. Uh, I've been, my next slide dives deeper into what our definition is, but um, there's a lot of communities that don't benefit from these advances in, in technology um, and projects really, really need to drive that point home of how are they benefit in communities and how are these communities underserved by the current uh, scope of projects either from the organization or from PG. So when I say underserved communities, uh, this is a, a short list of a larger list we have on our website, but uh, by no means this exhaustive. There's a lot of uh, communities and populations that are not um, receiving equitable um, exposure or equitable benefits from transportation electrification, and that is certainly a crucial component of the Drive Change Fund. So I'll let you read through these. Um, I don't think they are particularly surprising. Uh, I'm sure this list can be shared with a lot of other um, organizations, um, but we really want to drive these benefits to communities that um, are underserved, that are, are forgotten or passed over by most of our initiatives. And we're um, looking to our community partners to, to help us drive that. Um, and to make sure that we're um, working with the right people in the communities to have the proper impact. We don't want to pretend we know everything. We don't want to parachute in a project that doesn't fit with a, a mission of an organization. Um, so, you know, we're trying really hard to be a to be a, a partner in this. Um, you know, some some highlights: uh, low income uh, communities and low income individuals. Um, you know maybe don't have exposure or the ability to purchase a personal vehicle, and maybe the vehicles or transportation options they currently use are, are older, are dirtier, um, are, aren't just what's you know, the, the newest on the, on the market. Um, communities of color, immigrant communities, uh, tribal communities, uh, those are all communities that have not traditionally benefited from these improvements in uh, technology um, and um, especially in transportation electrification. So uh, even if they're not using personal vehicles, there's a lot of ways we can clean up their commute, clean up um, how they're moving throughout the city and throughout the state. And um, we really want to make sure that they are benefiting from these advancements as well. Um, so there's a lot of people on this list. I'm sure you know better than I do, um, but we're, we really want to make sure that these benefits are positively impacting these people and that they're able to see the benefits of transportation electrification in whatever form makes the most sense. Um, so it talks a lot about background of requirements, of preferences, and I want to summarize here um, as we get more to some more details. Uh, what is an ideal drive change fund application? And it's hard to really give a, an example of that without going step by step through questions on the application. All that's available on the website, but I thought that this was a good little visualization of what we're looking for. 
Um, so the four areas that I will be looking at and our third party of value would really be looking at. First of all, is it complete? And I know that's a, a simple starting point, but um, every year for grants I've worked on, there are questions unanswered, there are attachments not included, there are details not determined at the time of application. So I really encourage you take the time just to fill everything out, to write non-applicable when it's not applicable, uh, and get in touch if you have questions of how you're trying to answer it. I'm definitely here to be a resource and I don't want to leave you um, feeling unsupported um, if there's a question I can answer. Uh, the next step once you've completed the application is make sure that the, the program and the proposal is has a clear design and has really obvious benefits. So um, we want to make sure that how, whatever you're proposing is going to be successful and that and how it is going to be successful is important in determining if we are going to fund it. So I'd make sure that's really clear and really obvious, you know, using the metrics you might need to use or telling the story, you know, anecdotally you need to, to get your point across, make sure that's clear. Um, uh, tied to that is, is the, pro is the proposal feasible? Uh, timing wise, dollars wise, uh, resource, you know, staffing, things of that nature. So um, do your best to make it clear to the committee that this is uh, a project that there is support behind that you are going to drive it you know on a certain timeline uh, that is realistic and that the cost of it is both competitive but also allows you to do the things and have the impact you want so uh, that's going to be something that we're really going to be looking at um, as a selection committee uh, and, and finally and this is maybe you know uh, an overall uh, call to action is just make sure advances transportation electrification. Um, that's the goal of this fund is how do we further that initiative and how do we drive it towards communities that have not experienced it? So um, I think if you keep that in mind as your guiding light, uh, I think you're gonna be well on your way to having a strong application. Um, and I think the rest are some details that will kind of obviously come into place if you are trying to advance that initiative um, and really benefit the people that you're serving. Um, I have no doubt that a good application will come um, if you if you follow that path. So more specifics from a complete application, uh, eligible costs. Um, I don't think it's too surprising here. Um, you know, capital equipment, you know, equipment costs, construction, some of those costs to make sure that the, the project is um, you know, being charged properly or whatever you may need from both the vehicle and from a service standpoint. Um, some of that pre-designed work with engineering, designing, permitting, you wanna make sure that that is done properly and uh, clearly uh, depending on what the scope is. So that's all eligible. Um, some three-year forecasted maintenance, so some O&M plans uh, for the short term, realizing that this is probably a new realm for many organizations and we want you to feel supported if something does go wrong or just general maintenance that has to happen on the site to make sure things don't go wrong. Um, and, and then network subscriptions and licensing fees. Um, again, three-year cost. We think that's an, a, a nice runway for organizations that um, are going to be utilizing those services to get used to what's needed to be done to keep the uh, infrastructure or the vehicle uh, working properly. Uh, but then after that, it would be up to the organization uh, to pay for those ongoing uh, costs. Uh, but hopefully the benefits are, you know, outweigh the cost at that point and it's a relatively minimal uh, budget expense. There is financial assistance. Um, so that's a separate application, but it's the same information that's in the full application. Um, if you go on the website, it's, it's pretty clearly laid out what we need for that, um, but we do cover financial assistance uh, up to $2,000 per eligible uh, applicant. So if you need that, just to make sure that you're not losing time and money, if you are a particularly small nonprofit, um, please fill 
about that application and uh, we can discuss more offline. Uh, so with that, we have ineligible costs. Uh, these are some things that have come up uh, time over time. So I wanted to be really clear what we can and cannot fund. Uh, fuel costs, um, you know, this is electric vehicle. Uh, th uh, so that's the electric fuel we're di discussing. Um, that electric service is not eligible. So we can't help pay um, for your electricity bills. Obviously, it's going to go up with this new service, but that is something that we cannot cover. Hopefully, the cost of gas or whatever you were fueling your old vehicle with is um, those savings can cover the uh, increased electricity usage. Uh, in most cases, that is that is accurate. Uh, extended warranty costs, uh, anything that's going to go beyond um, just the normal package of a vehicle or a charger, we are unable to fund. Um, like I said, there are some O&M costs that we can cover, but warranty specific is going to be an extended warranty uh, that would have to be taken on by the organization. Uh, same thing with insurance costs. We don't want to be on the hook for for those. Um, those seem a little bit more like soft costs um, that an organization should want to have in place and in their own name. And we don't want our funding tied to tied to that. Um, we, we would prefer an organization to put that um, on on their own budget um, so they have full control of the safety of their driver and of their equipment. Um, and then finally, and generally, uh, any site costs that are not directly required, um, our site improvement costs not directly required for electrification. So um, we do cover line extension costs depending on how what how your service is designed at your location for a potential charging infrastructure. But if you're doing other things involved in that that aren't directly uh, necessary to make that electrification happen, then that's not going to be eligible. Um, it's going to be really specific uh, proposal to proposal. So please get in touch and we would be happy to discuss further. Um, but ultimately, um, if it's not necessary, uh, we are unable to fund it just because of how this fund was designed and what the money should be going towards. I wanted to discuss process and what to expect as you move through a uh, potential application to submitting one to uh, you know, eventual evaluation and selection. So the application is available online right now. Um, it's been updated since 2019, so you'll see a little bit new formatting with some new questions, but hopefully pretty similar. Uh, you can download that, you can fill it out online. Um, the boxes should expand for your questions, and then there are attachments we're expecting. So when you submit your application, Please include all of that information or include a reason why you don't have that information. And that will be accepted through 5 p.m. on September 1st. Um, so an important date to keep in mind, that is the final due date at 5 p.m. Uh, West Coast time. Um, please send all of that information to the PGE Drive Change Fund at pgn.com. That's going to be the inbox that I manage and um, sending all those materials. I will see them and send you a uh, an email saying that I have accepted um, your application. Um, if it's so big, uh, please send multiple emails. That's fine. Just let us know how many you're sending. Uh, the evaluation is uh, usually a phone interview accompanied with a full detailed evaluation from our third party evaluator. So they will go through the, the project, see um, what questions need to be answered, what areas um, could potentially be improved on, uh, ask any questions, uh, and then give a, uh, an, a recommendation and a score to the selection committee. That is not the only thing the committee looks at, but it is a piece of the, of the puzzle to determining who is deserving. So uh, just because you had a very high quantitative score from the evaluator doesn't necessarily mean you will get funded. It certainly is a good thing to have, but um, there's a lot more context and a lot more information that comes out in discussion that maybe isn't captured in the scoring rubric specifically. 
So please keep that in mind. Um, finally, there is a presentation to the selection committee. They review and approve um, the, the projects up to the 2.25 million for 2020. So we do our best to distribute that money um, to as many organizations as possible to have the maximum impact. Uh, and then quickly thereafter, we will get into award agreements, um, signing the paperwork, uh, and then awardees webinar to kind of go over what the expectations and reporting cadence is uh, once you are actually uh, awarded the money. 75% uh, of the funding is expected to go out the door uh, upon receiving a signed award agreement. So um, it, you can make the case for all funding up front, but we do expect that at the time you send in your award agreement, we will be able to process a check for 75% of what you're awarded. So hopefully that money gets into your hands quickly and you can start your project in earnest uh, as soon as you are ready. Uh, the rest of the funding, uh, depending on how much you got up front, uh, can be distributed at some other milestone. Say you need it for you know, buying a vehicle or doing another part of your project, or it could be at project completion once you are finished up. Um, you know, those can be conversations that we'll have down the road once you're ready. So this is what 2020 looks like. Uh, you know, obviously outreach and Q&A period got uh, pushed back from what we expected and certainly looks a lot different than what we intended, but I'm glad that we've been able to have conversations and have webinars to hopefully refer back to. The round opened on July 1st, so not too long ago, but hopefully a lot of you who are viewing this are uh, interested and on your way to getting a project off the ground. Uh, if not, I want to be clear that this funding will be available in 2021 and 2022 at the very least, and we're expecting a similar total fund of approximately two and a quarter million dollars. So if September 1st seems way too soon, especially given, given everything going on in the world, um, you know, please use this time to maybe look at next year. Um, this should be an additional project that, um, that hopefully is exciting and hopefully is interesting doesn't feel like a burden. We, we really want to try and make this uh, fund be available to those to, to do extra good work that they're already doing. So the application will be submitted by September 1st at 5. And then it goes right into the evaluator's hands to read, to review, to score, to ask questions as needed. Um, so we're expecting that to be approximately two, two and a half months, depending on round size so the more applications we have the longer that will take um, but we're really expecting by around december 1st we will be able to um, meet as a committee to make our decisions you know about three months after the close and then uh, we can make our decisions and get in contact about award agreements our expectation and our hope is to have to let all awardees know of their funding status by the end of the year uh, if we have an agreement in place that's great but uh, if we can announce publicly and let you all know what your funding status would be, then that is ideal. So you can go into the new year knowing that, knowing you have that money coming to you and it's just paperwork that is holding things up. So that's our goal and we'll do our best to meet those timelines, uh, milestones. Okay, uh, well that's the end of the content. This is some summary and some uh, high level takeaways that uh, I thought would be important. Um, these are kind of the things that I think uh, help to um, summarize what I've said and make it easily. Um, so if you have um, people who might be interested or others in your organization that you want to get um, feedback from, I think these next couple of slides are a really good way of condensing what I've said. I like this checklist because I think it's really a good way of knowing if you are ready for a project um, or if there are still boxes out here that you are unable to check. So you've identified the site, you have the feasibility assessment completed and you know what can and cannot happen. You decided on equipment or needs or anything that's going to be in the scope of your project. That's been identified and started to be uh, you know, uh, drawn up. Uh, you have a, a, a contract either in hand or a proposal in hand from your preferred contractor. 
I think that allows you to move confidently forward with the project um, and also uh, kind of ties you to somebody so you know that the prices that you were quoted aren't going to you know go up all of a sudden. Uh, if there are additional funding sources, you have secured or started to secure those. You've developed a plan for education, for community outreach, uh, just for including your community in this and kind of building that groundswell of support and that excitement. Um, and then you've completed the application, you've put on the, the appendices. So I think you, if you do all of those things up until you actually fill out your application, it allows you to have all the pieces you need to then form into a really strong application. Um, some of these might not apply to everyone depending on what you're proposing, but I think that uh, is a pretty clear and concise way of saying, are we on track or are we missing something that's going to lead to either an incomplete or a not strong answer on the application. One thing I get asked about is new or upgraded service depending on the location and depending on what kind of charging infrastructure you are proposing. So um, there is a uh, newer upgraded service application that you would fill out, but you would not have that dollar amount available to you to include in your application. It's a little bit of a, uh, a weird timing thing um, because if you're going to ask PG's service folk for a newer upgraded service, they are going to charge you for that work. And we don't want anybody to be charged for something that's not guaranteed. So we will work with you to make sure we're getting those those um, applications processed properly. Um, so you can get in touch with me if you have questions. I can also get in touch with our technical ex experts to uh, help you with anything specific. Um, but knowing you might need it, you're totally fine leaving a line item as TBD or you know pending or whatever makes sense for your budget. So we know, we generally know what the range is and we know what we might have to add to an award for those potential line extension costs or those service upgrade costs. So we are, uh, we're prepared for that, but we realize that timing wise, um, we didn't want to put a burden on our organization without it being necessary. If you have questions about that, uh, please get in touch. Uh, and finally, to takeaways. If you didn't listen to anything else, this is the slide to pay attention to. Uh, $2.25 million available for 2020. Uh, same as last year, we're looking for a really great turnout and we're expecting you know, uh, a lot of interest. Uh, the round has been open on July 1st and it closes on September 1st. So still, uh, you know, a solid six weeks to get things together. But like I said, we are uh, looking to make this available uh, for at least next year and the year after. Um, to, to summarize what uh, our preference is, we want new battery electric vehicles that move people. That would be our ideal applicant that's serving an underserved community. So that's a, you know, there's a lot in there, but I think that's the easiest way to, to think about what we're looking for for projects. Uh, tell your story. Uh, we don't know these organizations as much as we should, so help us. Please tell your story. Please let us know what we need to do and how we can help you meet your goals or, meet, or um, align with your mission. Um, finally, you know, you, utilize PGE, work with us, and let us help you, help you, you know, get across the finish line. Um, you know, we don't want to tell you what to do or pretend that we know best, but we also um, we know where our strengths lie and we know what role we can play. So please get in touch with us. Um, please make use of our resources. Um, finally, uh, a cost competitive application that meets all of our expectations in terms of milestones and scope uh, is going to be a really strong application to consider. Um, we would prefer those to be completed by the end of 2021, but we realize that time might be uh, more difficult with everything going on in the country and the world. So we will certainly work with you. But I want to put that out there as a, um, a hopeful expectation that we're able to meet those goals. If you have more questions, uh, I always suggest going to the Drive Change Fund website. Uh, we just updated it with a bunch of information. That's where this recording uh, was posted. 
So if you received it from a colleague uh, or a friend, uh, that is where it lives. Um, the website is portlandgeneral.com slash drive change. That will give you all the information you need, contact information, videos, uh, you know, anything that would be um, be important to you as you're looking to fill out an application. So I always suggest going there first for information and then getting in touch with me um, or your other PGE contacts um, as uh, things develop and you have things that are more specific to you and your organization. Next steps, go to the website, get those materials, design your project with that, that uh, project completion checklist that I had on an earlier slide. Uh, get your team together, get your community excited, get your organization excited for hopefully something that really moves the needle and is a, um, you know, a, a highlight of this year or next year. I think we all need some good news right now. Making sure you're talking with the right experts and contractors to have the technical side done, but only you know the organization side and the impact that you can have. So I, I would, you know, I would encourage you to tell your story. Um, and make uh, help make the community understand why this would be so important. Um, now that you have a little bit of an insight onto our preferences and requirements and our eligibility information, make sure your application is touching on those right things and submit by September 1st. Um, that's kind of all there is to it. Um, we're really excited to see some more interesting applications that um, really move us towards the future I think we all imagine. So I realize uh, this being a pre-recorded webinar, there's not really an opportunity for questions, but if you do have questions, please reach out to me. I am absolutely here as a resource. Um, I monitor the Drive Change Fund inbox, so PGE Drive Change Fund at pgn.com. I will see that. I'll get back to you as soon as I can uh, to make sure that you have everything you need to be successful. Uh, that number is my uh, office number. Um, that will cascade to my cell phone so that I can uh, be reached uh, that way as well if you think it's easier to talk through something on the phone. But either way, I will be getting back to you as soon as I can. Um, you know, I'm definitely, I'm here for you all um, and I'm here to, to support you in your endeavors. Uh, thank you so much for the time. I realize this was a long webinar, especially without any opportunity to interact. So thank you for your attention, uh, thank you for your interest, and thank you for all the great work that you already do. And I really look forward to hopefully partnering with as many of you as possible uh, to continue to push uh, great achievements uh, in our communities. I uh, hope you're all staying safe and staying well and staying sane. Uh, thank you, um, and I hope to be in touch soon.